So good morning to everyone. I think we'll get started. Welcome to our webinar, Florida Phase 3, and what it means to you. First and foremost, I want to say that I hope everyone is staying healthy and safe. My name is Kim Pinillos. I'm a Vice President with First Service Residential. Our discussion today will follow a question and answer format where we will answer the questions that you've submitted in advance, as well as any more questions that may come in during the webinar from the attendees. If you have a question at any time, please enter it through the question feature on the Zoom webinar format. Throughout the webinar, you'll also hear from my colleagues, Eleanor Goldstein, who's providing technical support. Joining me today is Donna DiMaggio Berger, She's a shareholder at Becker, and Donna is recognized as a foremost authority in community association law. Good morning. Thanks for having me, Kim. Thank you so much for your partnership and sharing your expertise on today's webinar. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. So let's get started. As I mentioned, we did receive some questions in advance of the webinar. And as you can imagine, based on the interest in this topic, there's a lot of them. So we thought it best to start by tackling the most frequently asked questions to make the best use of our time together this morning. So our first question, and, and I would say most popular one, Donna, is now that we've entered phase three, is the board required to lift restrictions that we've implemented as a result of COVID-19? And Kim, the short answer is no. The, this phase three reopen order, which the governor issued on September 25th. And by the way, I think the title of the order is instructive. I jotted it down. It is executive order 20-244. And the title is right to work, business certainty and suspension of fines. And I'm sure you're gonna ask me about suspension of fines later. But you can tell even from the title of the order that that order was directed at businesses, stimulating the economy and particularly restaurants and giving them some guidance with regard to what they can and can't do in terms of indoor dining and capacity. So the short answer is this phase three reopen order is going to have almost no impact on private residential communities unless your board wants it to. For mixed use communities, Kim, where there are commercial units, yeah, there may be some impact if the board has imposed um, restrictions on the business activity in those commercial units. But for private residential communities, this order does not mean that you need to reopen uh, amenities if they're still closed, or that if you have your amenities operating on a reduced schedule, that you now need to open it up to seven days a week, eight to 10 hours a day. That's great. For those associations that are um, reopening common areas and amenities, what is the current recommendation on social distancing in common areas? Well, you know, it's interesting. We're telling our clients, Kim, to continue to look to the medical experts at this, the Florida Department of Health, the CDC. Both are still recommending, obviously, social distancing, which is minimum of six feet, but many people feel comfortable expanding that a little further to eight to 10 feet. Um, certainly uh, facial coverings when in common areas where you cannot be socially distanced. Uh, again, a lot of this is going to be an evaluation on a community by community basis in terms of your, your resident population, whether or not you have had or have active infections and how, how well you can manage your infrastructure and your amenities. But certainly social distancing and facial coverings, absolutely. I don't have a single uh, client, Kim, that's not enforcing those. No, agreed. Um, what are the recommendations um, in allowing guests in common areas and amenities like pools, gyms, gazebos? Should they be allowed now? And in what numbers? Those are some common questions. Yeah, great, great question. Well, you know, the, the local orders were a little bit different. For instance, Broward County said clearly no guest usage at the pool. Uh, Palm Beach County did not have that. But we've had, you know, we've got 67 counties in Florida. We had associations throughout the state borrowing from other county orders, things they liked. So just let's say you were in Collier County and you didn't, you didn't feel comfortable having guests using your pool. 
uh, or your tennis courts. Just because your local order didn't address that did not mean that your, local, that your board in Collier could not impose a guest restriction. So as we sit here today in mid-October, there's a couple things. We are still under a statewide state of emergency until November 3rd. Now the governor may push that out beyond November 3rd, depending on the numbers, or he may not. And we can talk about what happens to emergency powers if the state of emergency ends on November 3rd. But as we sit here today, we are still in the midst of a pandemic. As of October 8th, 726,013 Floridians have tested positive for the virus. Um, the pandemic continues, although thankfully the death number is going down. Um, but we've just reopened a lot of things. You know, we are, we are at the, the beginning of phase three, so we have to be cautious. In terms of guest restrictions, I would say this. If you are able to take your foot off the brakes a little bit, ease up a little bit, and you feel you can manage it, then we've got communities that are, that are doing that. But again, there is no requirement that you do that if in your board's best estimation, you need to continue to keep an eye on who's coming and going in the community. Um, certainly family and friends, it's not the same situation, Kim, as at the beginning when we really did, we really did limit the number of, of family and friends, but still certainly there should be nobody listening to this webinar who is going to reopen the clubhouse and open it to private gatherings. That is just a big no-no right now while we're still in the midst of a, a, a pandemic. Right. What, um, what is the board's responsibility on this? In other words, we've talked about boards being cautious and, and not having a requirement to reopen the amenities, but in terms uh, of the board's duty towards the community. Um, yeah, I, I have to say, and I'm sure you join me, you know, for all our board members out there, thank you for not handing in your, your, your resignations immediately after this started. I served on my own HOA board for two years. I like to joke that it was the longest two years of my life, given what I do professionally. Um, there is a great deal riding on the decisions you make as a board. Uh, you know, there's just no other way to say that. Board members are in only very limited circumstances personally liable for the decisions they make, okay? For the most part, you're sitting on the board as long as you have DNO coverage. I've never seen a set of condo or HOA or co-op documents that doesn't require the uh, doesn't indemnify the directors for their service. So for the most part, you're pretty covered. However, I say that with the caveat, two caveats. Um, one, if you are a Florida condominium director, there is language in the statute, it's 718.111.1D, that makes directors personally liable if they display a wanton uh, disregard for public health and safety. Now, I want to let that sink in. I hope, hopefully there were no gasps on the other end, but that language is out there. That raises the stakes. The other thing that may raise the stakes is you may have in your articles or bylaws an affirmative duty placed on the board to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the residents. Now, this is not in every set of documents, Kim, but it is in some documents. I've seen it. So if we sit here in mid-October and you don't know if that language is in your documents, you need to, when you get off this webinar, call your association attorney and say, look at the powers section and obligation section in our articles and bylaws and give us an opinion. Do we have an affirmative obligation placed on our board with regard to the public health and safety in our, in our community? Now that's legally. Let's talk about morally. Yes, there's an obligation to put safety first. Always. Always. People are looking to you to make tough decisions. It's going to be tough. And especially now with the government orders pulling back, there's less place to, to, to look to for guidance, which means we can no longer say as a board, we're doing this because the county's making us or the state is making us. You have to have the strength of conviction to tell your people, we're doing this because this is what we think is needed to protect our residents. That's, that's a great point, Donna. Um, I know a lot of our communities are struggling, um, not only with opening amenities, but also with considering, do they still want to limit outside guests to the community, especially in the amenity areas? Yeah, and you know what, Kim? I think some of the pushback from the residents is born out of two things. 
One, I don't think they realize the potential liability should a resident or a visitor, you know, it's not just residents who could bring a claim. It could be somebody's neighbor who showed up and said, I haven't gone anywhere, but you know, my friend's condo's pool. And I think that's where, you know, I got this disease. So it's, it's the potential. I don't think they understand the potential for liability and that there's a lack of coverage right now mm -hmm. for these claims. And I think the other source of pushback is that some boards have just shut things down and they're not communicating with the members. I understand you have to make tough decisions, but you should probably let your people know we're making these tough decisions, but we do have a plan for the future. And if things keep heading in the right direction, here's our anticipated you know, future plans for either reopening or expanding the hours of operation. I agree. The, the communication with the community and the, the, the phased approach to reopening a more measured stance um, seems to be a lot of the direction that the associations are going, a lot of the boards are going, even with pressure from residents. So we really do appreciate those board members who have taken their, their duties very seriously and are, are doing everything they can to protect our communities. With that said, you know, a lot of them have been very proactive and working to um, issue violations and, and perhaps fines for those people that break the rules. Um, requiring, for example, facial coverings in common areas. So the question has come up recently, are they still able to issue fines for those? Yeah, and the answer is yes. So the governor's order has suspended a collection of fines at the government level, not at your level. So associations can still issue fines. They can still uh, issue suspension of use rights, uh, Kim, to the common areas. Mm -hmm. So if you, you know, this is particularly important if you've opened the pool and you or the gym and you've got somebody in your community who's going there they're they're not wearing a facial covering walking to the to the area they're not observing social distancing you're going to want to take swift action to make sure that the person violating that you know in that regard if you have a practical ability to suspend that person's right to get into the pool like shutting off a key fob that's what you're going to want to do yeah absolutely and that's a, that's a great point um there's some discussions also um, about playgrounds and for our associations that have playgrounds or even playrooms. Um, some of our associations, especially in the condo world, have, have playrooms for children. Um, obviously, that's always a place where its germs are easily spread. Um, sanitation and limiting um, interaction, the children's interaction is, is not, I don't think, an unreasonable expectation. Um, would you recommend posting use at your own risk type signage in some well, of these areas? Yeah, actually in those areas where we know it's gonna be virtually impossible to maintain social distancing. I mean, I've had kids, I, I mean, I, you know, you can say stay, you know, six feet away. It's not going to happen. Right. So you may want to keep those areas closed where you know, if it's a playground or a playroom, this may not be the time in the midst of a pandemic to be opening that. We just saw already that there are infections. I think there's one or two infections uh, amongst elementary school children in Florida already. So we know that there's a possibility of transmission amongst children and then passing it to adults. Uh, you'd have to have a compelling reason to open those areas right now. And I know there will be pushback from families and there's the potential for a family to say, hey, the closure of the playground or the playroom has a disproportionate impact on me because I have children. The answer to that is we get that, but if we couldn't enforce social distancing at the pool, we would shut the pool down too. If we couldn't enforce social distancing in the gym, we would shut the gym down too. The problem is with the, with the playground, you would have to have a mo monitor, maybe several, and almost takes away from the entire playground experience as well. I guess at the, you know, one option is you have one household at a time use that facility. That may be the, the, the compromise option. Right, and, and, and that's certainly something to consider, but I agree with you when we're dealing with small small humans, it's a little different sometimes and a little difficult to get them to, you know, most of them at that age are not wearing face masks. 
Um, especially and they're not rational people, Kim. Right. <laughs> right. I've had kids. They're not rational. <laughs> Me um, too. They're not. But let me um, circle back to your sign question because it's yeah. really important. So. Mm -hmm. Signs, certainly part of the, one of the tools in the toolkit to confront, you know, this contagion, but not one of my favorite tools, and I'll tell you why. Um, it's not as if you put a sign and say, use the monkey bars at your own risk. The adult is there, they see it, uh, they look at it, and they still let their child go on the monkey bars. He or she falls off and hurts themselves. That's a different risk than... You know, the nanny takes the child to the playground or the playroom, reads the sign or doesn't read the sign, goes back, interacts with somebody else, that person gets sick, that person never read the sign. So when you're talking about using signage or releases, and we should talk about releases later, to insulate a board from liability, um, it's not as useful a tool when you're, when you're confronting a communicable disease. Yeah, that's a great point. And, and, and releases, I know, or something, and we can maybe shift over to that, is something that um, some of our communities have considered for vendors, right? When vendors want to come in or um, outside contractors want to come in, some of our communities are considering releases for those folks when they want to come in. So, would, so re releases for residents, courts generally disfavor releases, as you well know. But for vendors, for people coming into your community right now to do business, whether it's a realtor, whether it's a contractor, they are engaged in commerce at your building. For them, I like the use of an indemnification agreement and proof of insurance and adding the association as an additional insured. Um, if they will take those steps to protect the association, I think that the board can proceed with a little bit higher level of comfort. But again, you're dealing with somebody who has some means okay something we can go after you know residents when a resident signs a release or an indemnification it's very often it's very often worthless it's not worth the paper it's written on because there's no assets to go after there's no insurance policy to protect the association in the event of a third party claim but when you're dealing with a, a you know whether it's somebody coming in to redo a kitchen uh whether it's a realtor doing all the showing the, those those businesses tend to have some assets and the indemnification that they sign tends to have some, some value. That's a great point because we do require um, vendors that are coming in as, as well as contractors to provide those certificates of insurance with the indemnification on it. So that's a great point that I'm sure a lot of our boards will appreciate. Um, and, with, and with those folks, Kim, there's no reason if they're doing commerce for you to say we want protective gear we want a limited crew, whether it's a construction, we don't want any more than two people in a unit. You have to go straight from to the to and from the unit, no loitering, no going to the common areas, no using the common area bathrooms. Um, and with same thing with realtors, we want your people, you know, I've done policies that say you can only have X number of showings, private showings by appointment. You have to let us know ahead of time. We need to know the names of the people. It cannot be people coming in from out of town because both the Department of Health and the CDC, one of the things that they keep stressing, even though they've let go of a lot of their guidelines, is that when you've got people coming in from out areas, not local, it introduces additional risk. Absolutely, and you're absolutely right. And a lot of our associations are still very concerned about people coming from out of town, be it their own residents who are returning um, because these are second or third homes. Um, and also their visitors and guests. Um, now that the travel restrictions have been relaxed pretty consistently um, across the states, is there anything these associations can do um, to restrict guests coming from, let's call it hotspots? Yeah, so I do can have associations that is part of their COVID-19 protocols. Rather than picking and choosing what's a hot spot, because we know what was a hot spot last week may not be this week and vice versa. So they've just said, look, if you're coming from out of the state, we don't want you accessing the common areas, whether it's seven days or 10 days or 14 days. We no longer use quarantine, okay? Quarantine is a very life limiting situation. You're stuck Absolutely. at home. You're only <laughs> supposed to go to the doctor, leave the unit to go to the doctor. That's it. That's what a real quarantine situation means. 
Um, so what we're basically saying is you can come and go. You could go to the you know, mail room or you could, but we don't want you at the pool. We don't want you in the tennis courts if you're coming from out of state. Remember, your boards can create more restrictive protocol than what was in the local orders or what is in the local orders today. That's the floor. That's the minimum of what you can be doing. Under emergency powers, under the statute, which are in effect until November 3rd and possibly longer, you have the right as a board to take whatever measures you think are reasonably necessary to safeguard your residents. And if you want to say, hey, if you come in, you're an owner, you're coming in, but we don't want you at the pool for, for 10 days, okay? After that, you can. That's part of your COVID protocols. You can become more restrictive. Now, you still need to be reasonable. But courts, you know, courts give very broad deference to boards under the business judgment rule, okay? There's abundant case law in Florida. And by the way, Kim, we've seen it recently, you know, all these lawsuits that we keep uh, talking about and we're concerned about. We haven't seen any uh, negligence cases yet that somebody got sick, but you know the cases we are seeing? Cases from people pushing to be open. Cases from people saying, I, you know, I want to use the pool. I, I, I need to do therapy for my hip. I want to use the pool. Or I wanted to show my unit. Or I wanted to have an open house. Guess what the cases are coming out so far are doing? They're siding with the boards. Because as suspected, courts are giving very broad deference to board decisions. It has to be very egregious for a court to, to second guess a board's decisions. That's a great point because one of the questions that we had um, was as we are in phase three about the 55 and better communities. Um, so I think to your point, the fact that they have the ability to have more restrictive guidelines as opposed to the state orders is a great point. Um, is there anything specific that you might recommend for those communities? Well, for those communities, you really do have to take into account that you are operating and administering a, a community that has a, a highly vulnerable resident population. Um, you've got older people, many of whom may have underlying health conditions. So I think if, if that has to be a factor when you're evaluating what you want to continue doing with regard to your facial coverings, your distancing, even how you hold your meetings. You know, it's funny, we've always been told, Kim, Oh, you know, online voting, you know, 55 and over, not good, or 55 and better. I love that you guys call it that. Or, you know, virtual meetings, Zoom, they don't know. I will tell you across the board, my um, communities that are retirement communities, active lifestyle communities, they're embracing it. Um, one of the things that the, the CDC and Florida Department of Health have both said is that when it comes to transmission risk, guess what? What we're doing right now there is no way that I can get you sick and no way you can get me sick. It is virtually impossible uh, when you're doing a virtual meeting. The more people you add in, the more in-person contact, uh, the greater the risk goes. So, so for the 55 and better communities, I'm surprised but delighted that they are embracing technology now because of this crisis. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And I think a lot of our communities that had not embraced technology before now have um, almost been forced to. And they have and they love it. Um, and they're really enjoying it. And it's really allowing for a lot greater participation among the unit owners, especially for those that may be out of town or may not live full time at our communities and they're now able to participate. So our, something our communities are really enjoying and, and the um, They've, as you said, a lot of our communities have adopted online voting that perhaps had resisted in the past, and they're getting much greater participation, which I think is um, probably one of the best things that's come from this pandemic. Oh, absolutely. Particularly with so many communities, Kim, that have out-of-state owners. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. International owners. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and the international owners. So that's, it's nice to see that they're really start, starting to use some of these tools to the best of their um, ability. Um, what recommendations um, would we have, would you have for allowing residents to use pool furniture, even though there's no staff to disinfect it after each use? That's one of the questions that came from, came up um, as to whether or not it's sufficient for them just to provide sanitizing wipes for the pool furniture 
and leave the pool open without an attendant to actually do that work. So we forgot at the outset to give my standard disclaimer. I'm not giving specific legal advice to you unless my clients are listening and I know some of them are listening. So hello clients. Um, for the non-clients, this is not specific legal advice, but I'm going to talk to you for a second as if you were my client without giving you specific advice. If you are using, if you still have your pool association pool furniture out there and you're not cleaning it, it's a potential liability. Okay. One of the options is to follow what Broward County had said, which is, uh, and Palm Beach had actually said this, which is you've got an option to pull your furniture, put it all away. Let people bring their own pool furniture, bring it down, bring a chair, a lounge. I know it's a little inconvenient, but you minimize your risk that way. They can't sue the association for getting a, a, a disease off furniture that's not yours, okay? So if you have furniture out there, it behooves you as an association to clean it, okay? And clean it not regularly, not three days a week, if you've got your, unless you've got your pool open only three days a week. This is where, you know, factoring in, how many days do we want to have this pool open? How many days do we want? How many hours of operation each day? And are we leaving our furniture out there? Because we're going to need somebody to be cleaning this regularly. You could certainly say, you can certainly also provide wipes for your owners to use, but you cannot delegate duties to your owners and think that that's going to insulate you from liability. Arguably, an owner could claim that they got the disease because you forced them to clean association furniture after use and that perhaps it wasn't cleaned before they were using wipes to clean it. It's not a good idea, folks. If you have the option to put away your furniture and simply tell people the pool's open, bring your own furniture, do it. That's a great point. Um, we actually have a question from Richard Keller um, who asked, what may be the legal consequences if an HOA board closes an amenity such as a fitness center and doesn't provide a detailed reason. Um, he's concerned that preventing the HOA members from using the facilities um, that they're actually paying to maintain in their dues, even though the county permits usage. Right, so the liability is, is a lot less when you're dealing with that kind of a claim than when you're dealing with a wrongful death or personal injury claim because the gym was open and it wasn't cleaned and social distancing wasn't maintained. All of the, the health guidelines out there by professionals is that this disease is more highly communicable indoors. So your indoor spaces need to be more heavily scrutinized when you're opening them. Um, I think the board in question should let people know, and I don't know why they're not, should let people know, hey, here's a few of the reasons that we're not opening the gym. We're concerned about transmission. We don't have it budgeted to have somebody monitoring it. And we know how well the honor system works in most instances. It doesn't. Um, so, and they may wanna let people know, we don't have insurance should something go terribly wrong here. So one of the things I'm a fan of, Kim, when people are getting pushback is put a survey out to your members, okay? Here's what it would cost. We could do a special assessment. We could hire additional staff to clean the pool, to clean the, the gym, to monitor, enforce social monitoring, would you be in favor of that? It might be very instructive to see how many people are not in favor of a special assessment, but still want the gym open. Then you'll see where the, then you'll see where the tension point is. But the reality is a lot of people are not thinking about this. And in terms of the argument, well, why am I paying for the gym when I can't use it? Couple things. Often you're paying for the pool when it's being redone for months. Okay, the pool shut down because you're remarsiding it, you're redoing the pool deck, you need, you're completely revamping it. You don't typically have people, I guess you have some people, but most people understand that, that they have to keep paying even though they can't use the pool during that renovation project. You've got other people who would never step foot in a pool who still have to pay as part of their assessment to maintain the pool. The, the logic is really no different here. This is not going to last forever. Your gym will not be, not would, hopefully close forever. We will not be living under a state of emergency forever. But while we are, you are paying to maintain those things because those amenities contribute to the overall real property values in your community. 
So let's talk about, you've mentioned a few times about potential liability. And one of the questions that came up in our Q&A is, what is the potential liability for a board that has disregard for CDC guidelines and disregard for social distancing and, and gatherings? Yeah, I want that board who's listening, who maybe has a little more nonchalant attitude about all of this, to imagine sitting in a deposition or answering written interrogatories and how they would answer these questions. So on you know October 10th, you opened the gym, you had the gym open, the pool open, the clubhouse opened. Uh, we were still under a state of emergency. There was an ongoing pandemic what precautions did you take and then they have to be and why did you open by the way at that point what was the reason the answer cannot be we got tired or we caved into pressure from our owners the answer has to be we felt we could manage this and provide a standard of due care that is required to administer these amenities in the course of a pandemic you have to be able to answer these questions you know a lot of people have opened but they haven't really, their open operation, Kim, looks the same in October as it did last January before this pandemic hit. If, you, if there is no discernible difference, whether if you haven't erected signage, if you haven't hired uh, uh, and employed heightened sanitization, if you haven't removed the pool furniture, or if you've left it, you, don't, you haven't hired staff to clean, if you haven't limited guest usage, if me going to use that pool today or that gym looks exactly as it would have in January, that's gonna be a problem if you are sued. And the lawsuits that, that, and I've spoken to a few personal injury attorneys. Um, I have a few friends. Yes, they have friends, personal injury attorneys. And I've said to them, how can you even prove? How can you prove that somebody picked up or acquired this disease at, at an association gym or a card room or on the, you know, and their point is we don't have to prove 100% causality. We only have to prove that that association was operating under a standard of, negligently under a standard of due care. They were providing a negligent standard of care when operating those amenities. That's really what this boils down to guys, negligence. And then when we start talking about negligence, I think that board members may have some potential liability. Normally, per, well, if, if, if the negligence rises to a level of uh, wanton disregard, and listen, if I'm in a community, Kim, where we have active infections, either on the staff level or at the resident uh, level, and we still say, you know, we're opening everything and we're not hiring, you know, people to monitor, we're not hiring. Yeah, I think that's gotten to the point where you are at risk of a, a, a personal liability for displaying wanton disregard. Yeah, um, looks like there's a number of questions that have come in. Um, if they're asking if boards can ask for negative test results from someone who previously tested positive for COVID. Yeah, they do. I do have boards asking, particularly if, if, the, if the resident has advised that someone in the household has tested positive. So what we typically do with that, Kim, is we say we want you to quarantine the whole household we're gonna take all the steps, and I'm sure FSR does this. You take Absolutely. all the steps necessary to get them their mail, their deliveries, remove the trash, whatever needs to be done to keep that household safe and to keep the rest of the neighboring uh, residents safe as well. And then we do need something, whether it's a doctor's letter, whether it's a COVID test result. You know, months ago, Kim, when we had this, that was a hard litmus test because it was hard to get tests. So now oh, it's goodness. much easier, but speak to counsel. And again, this should be part of your COVID protocols. Absolutely. Um, all of the first service associations have, do have COVID protocols that we're operating under. And I know that some of the guests that we have perhaps on the webinar today um, may not be first service clients at the moment. Um, as we look through some of the additional questions that have that are coming in, um, we look at um, what should they look at in the future in terms of perhaps recreating some of these common area spaces, right? 
we see now that some associations are moving towards, I'll call it a disinfection room or a disinfection area right inside um, the entrance. Is there anything specific that you think that um, associations might want to look to now as we look at perhaps repurposing some of these areas? Yeah, I love that question because I think the new normal is going to be the new normal for years to come. Okay. It's like, it's like the changes we saw after 9-11 and the security changes, you know, our, our experience at the airport has never been the same. Now I'm not suggesting we, we want to have the horrible airport experience, but let me give you an example. Um, with retrofitting, with sprinklers in our high rises, I often recommended to my clients that were a few years from having from the deadline to install. But when they were doing lobby renovations, Kim, I said, you got to look about what's coming down the road. It's the same thing here. If we've got people listening that are in the midst of lobby renovations or other common area renovations, whether it's the, the recreational facilities, the gym, start thinking about traffic flow. Start thinking about touchless surfaces. If you're redoing the entryway, you may want to have those automatic open doors rather than rather than push in push out your bathrooms too you may want to have as many touchless surfaces as possible this may be as simple kim as redirect as re as uh, relocating furniture so you know rather than couches where you've got people who maybe chairs spaced out all of this why waste money if you're in the midst of redoing things you may mm -hmm. want to think about how to how to make this more functional and i by the way i know developers and architects and designers are all thinking about this now for the future in terms of the commercial spaces and the residential spaces they're designing. Absolutely. We have associations that we're working with now, as I said, that are looking at redesigning some of the interior spaces. And we're certainly looking at a lot of those options and, and even in common areas outdoors, because I agree with you. I think this is going to be the, the new normal going forward for, for quite some time. Um, Even air filtration systems in these buildings, you know, at the mm -hmm. outset of this pandemic, I, I wrote a blog and likened the, the standing uh, high rises to stationary cruise ships, because in some of those buildings, they have shared filtration. It's the same issue when you're dealing with an airborne disease, which we know now that COVID-19 is an airborne disease. Absolutely. A lot of our associations are looking at modifications to those HVAC systems, especially the closed systems, where they don't have a fresh air intake to provide fresh air intake and or provide some disinfection with that airflow. So it's, um, it's certainly a lot of new territory for a lot of our, for a lot of our clients collectively. Um, and certainly something that um, we have to consider. Um, we had an interesting question come through and is, is there going, we're in currently in phase three. The question is, is there a phase four? Well, currently I'm not aware of one, but. I'm not, I'm not aware of one, but phase four will be when the governor uh, no longer extends the statewide state of emergency and Basically, that's it. We're, we're, we're back to normal. Not sure when that's going to happen, um, but we're, we're, you know, we're almost there. Even though the numbers, the, the numbers don't quite support that yet in terms of the transmission rate. Again, mm -hmm. at the outset, I said the fatality rate is going down. I did want to mention one quick thing that I haven't mentioned yet on a, on a webinar. There is a Missouri case that came out recently where the um, federal court held that COVID does damage, physical damage to property um, because it, it attaches to physical surfaces and renders them uninhabitable and unusable. That's a really significant case. Now that case was in, it was framed with a hair salon um, looking for business, make a business interruption claim. But in terms of our emergency powers, I think it's a really significant case because everybody's been talking about, well, do we need to do all this cleaning? Do we need to, you know, can we shut things off while it is, you know, while it's a case out in Missouri, it's not going to have a precedential value here. I think it's interesting that the court in that case ruled that COVID, unlike just dust, COVID actually 
um, it adheres, can adhere to surfaces and can render those areas uninhabitable or unusable. Yeah, I, I think that's a very interesting ruling as well. And um, wonder if it will have ramifications long term in terms of property insurance. Oh, I'm sure we can. I'm sure we can all brace for increased <laughs> increased <laughs> premiums. Sadly, I think we're we're already we're already there with the increased premiums. Um, I see a question coming in um, about what is the appropriate way to communicate to residents that somebody in the community is tested positive, and I know that we recommend that we notify the community that a member of the community has tested positive. Um, and the precautions that the community should take. But beyond that, um, we don't provide any other identifying information. Is there anything above and beyond that that you feel that some of these communities should be doing? I think it's very smart. First of all, not notifying is a huge problem, okay? And it does open you up to liability for people down the road saying, my community, we had an infection. Uh, and we were never notified. So absolutely what you're doing, Kim, makes sense. You would notify, it would be anonymous. You would not identify the person or the floor or the building, if there's different buildings, because that does what? It provides a false sense of security. Oh, I haven't seen Bill, so I must be okay. Um, one of the things I do with my notifications, Kim, is I, t I use it as an, op an opportunity to reinforce two things in the community. One, here are the COVID safety protocols we put in place and why. And because it, once there is an infection, I will tell you, it tends to make, it's an aha moment for a lot of people where they tend to get it a little bit better. And then secondly, it reinforces, because you're doing it anonymously, it reinforces that please let us know if you, if you do have a member of your household test positive or be exposed so we can help you. It, it will not in any way be an embarrassing or uh, uncomfortable uh, situation for you to do that. So I think that notification uh, serves two purposes. One, it helps reinforce why the board has passed and continues to enforce the safety protocols they do. And two, it encourages people to come forward if they do have an infection. Right, and I think that one of the things that we've done in our communities is be very proactive in the resident services with packages, deliveries, assisting with groceries and things. And we've done that for everyone. Um, we've made those services available for everyone because we do have immune compromised people in some of our communities. Um, so there really was no stigma attached to, oh, they got their groceries delivered or, or oh, they have somebody assisting with dog walking because we across the board have where our communities have had the staff available and a lot of, especially in high rise, have offered those services ahead of time. So there was really no stigma attached to um, someone taking, you know, picking up their trash or helping with dog walking or, or groceries deliveries or anything like that. So it's been, um, I think, um, we've tried to make it as pleasant an experience as we can for our residents and that's, so that they're that's not smart. What do you do, Kim, with regard to uh, staff or employee infections and notification? So we follow the same protocol and, and advise that someone in the community, within the community has tested positive. Obviously, we are following the CDC protocol for any of our associates that test positive, um, along with contact tracing, right, and our associates um, stay home in accordance with the, the prescribed medical advice and don't return to work until they're allowed to. So we've been very proactive in that respect. And one of the other things that we've done also, not only to limit the employee's exposure, but to limit the resident's exposure as well, is unless it's a true emergency, our staff is not going into units and has not. Um, because that limits the exposure for the resident, limits the exposure for our associates as well. So they've been spent a lot of time on common areas and a lot of our staff has been repurposed um, to help with, with cleaning and disinfection in a lot of areas. So, um, which has been helpful in, you know, the, the associations maybe not having to hire an additional person for the pool because we can repurpose that additional janitorial person that we had that was cleaning perhaps club room and things like that that have been closed to these other areas. 
to help. That's also them. sometimes what residents don't understand is that it's not as if the costs have gone down because of this pandemic and areas being closed. If anything, costs have gone up because now you're taking on additional cleaning. Uh, I know our phones are ringing off the hook, so your, your legal fees have probably gone up because you need guidance. Um, you know, the costs just have not gone down from what I've seen. Yeah, agreed. And, and, you know, with the hand sanitizing stations and clean rooms and a lot of, you know, there's a lot of additional supplies and things over and above that the associations didn't previously have. Yeah. So that's a great point. Um, and our associations are looking at that um, from a budget perspective going into 2021, because although we're in phase three, it's certainly not, you know, COVID is certainly not gone. Um, so certainly very helpful um, going forward as we move hopefully out of this pandemic very shortly. Are you budgeting for 2021? I know we're going, we're heading into budget season. What, it, what are you recommending in terms of uh, increased, you know, line items for certain things related to COVID? Well, we're actually looking, we actually were very proactive in this respect and, and encouraged our association managers to add a GL code that was specific to COVID expenses so that we can really quantify those expenses for the, mem for the board and the membership. And we can really look at what we spent in 2020 um, COVID expenses, whether it was legal or additional janitorial supplies or staffing. So a lot of our associations, and it, it's an association by an association choice, and we're doing, treating it very individually. As I said, some of our associations, especially with vulnerable populations, have been um, much more um, proactive in keeping things, um, I don't wanna say completely closed because they're not completely closed, but a very measured reopening and they're looking to continue that into 2021, I think until we um, are in a better situation in terms of the infection rate and everything else. So they and perhaps are the vaccine because you right. know, if you, if you open everything and then the numbers take a, a bad turn in November and December, as some, as many of the health experts are warning, it's so much harder to pull back. So Absolutely. people have gotten used to the completely open schedule. And now once again, you have to shut them down. I think psychologically that's harder to contend with than continuing on a more measured, as you said, uh, approach. Yeah, absolutely agree. And as, as we enter into what's typically known for us as season, and we have a lot of our um, unit owners from, from up north and other areas return, um, which also coincides with flu season and everything else, as you said, and there is a projection and some potential for increased infection. I think the that the measured approach has been probably the best approach so far. I understand residents want to come back and we all want everything back to normal, but we, none of us want to be sick either. So I think protecting, protecting our residents and the measured approach um, and an individual approach with each board has been, has real, and community has really been the best. Um, so I think it looks like our time is about up here um we hope that you all have found the information helpful in determining the direction to take your hoa or, or condominium as always it's best to consult your association attorney regarding your community and your specific needs i want to thank you for attending our webinar florida phase three and what it means to you and thank you donna for your infinite wisdom on condo and associate community association law um, it's been truly helpful and I always appreciate the opportunity to work with you um, for those of you that are attending the webinar if you have any additional questions we may not have covered please submit them to client experience.fl at fsresidential.com that's client experience.fl at fsresidential.com. And thank you very much. And I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, Kim. Thank you.